I'm Sherry Baver. I'm delighted to be here at the Noble Maritime Collection this afternoon. Beautiful building. Uh, I'm a professor at CUNY, at City College and the Graduate Center. We are talking this afternoon about Jewish pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and I should say, first of all, that this is based on a book by Edward Kritzler that I came across several years ago. Uh, I have added other uh, books to this lecture, but uh, I thought that was a really very intriguing title. So I wanted to learn more, and I hope you'll want to uh, learn more. Uh, we always start lectures with questions. So the first question we want to ask is, why were there pirates of the Caribbean? And what was this era of piracy in the Caribbean about? Uh, the era that we're talking about is roughly 1550 to 1700. The height of the pirate era in the Caribbean, which is known as the Buccaneer era, is roughly 1650 to 1700, and we'll try to talk about that too. Now, the second question is, why were there Jewish pirates in the Caribbean? And I will tell you the uh, ending. You're not supposed to really tell the ending at the beginning. But the ending is that there were a lot of Jews in the Caribbean at this point. There weren't too many pirate, Jewish pirates in the Caribbean at this point. But there were a few. Um, so to give you a little background, the, we're going to go back. Um, to the age of discovery, as it is known in history, which is roughly something like 1450 to 1700. So the two major European superpowers at the time, which were Portugal and Spain, and perhaps you know this because we learned this a little bit in elementary school, maybe high school too, were looking for routes to, sea routes to Asia. And certainly by around 14. 90, the Portuguese had sailed around the southern tip of Africa and were finding their way to Asia. So of course, Spain also wanted to compete and do something similar and was thinking about sailing, finding a westward route to Asia. Um, we also have to talk a little bit about Spain at this point 
because we're wondering where these Jews came from who ultimately uh, ended up in the Caribbean. Spain was unusual in Europe at this point from about 711, in fact, to 1492. A lot of things happened in the year 1492. But after 711, there was a Muslim takeover of most of Spain. And indeed, at this point, um, for most of the next 700 to 800 years, uh, the Muslims and the Christians in Spain, um, and indeed the Jews who kept moving into Spain, because the story of the Jews in Europe at this point and the Middle East and North Africa was to find a safe place to live, was that Spain was a safe place to uh, live. Most of this history um, is called, is known in Spanish as la convivencia, the peaceful coexistence. It wasn't completely peaceful, but basically it was the place in Europe where Muslims, Christians, and Jews live together than in any other place. So around um, 1200, there were crusades going on in Northern Europe, and the Christians of Spain um, decided that it was time to begin to try to uh, reunite Spain as a Christian uh, kingdom. Um, and 1492 is an important year because uh, we know of it because we know that Columbus sailed in 1492, but Columbus sailed paid for by the queen and king of Spain, and the queen was much more important because she was the queen of a much more important uh, province, Castilla, um, was hired to celebrate the reunification of Spain under uh, the Catholic monarchs. 1492 was the last battle of this reconquest. Granada was taken from the Muslims, and the queen and king wanted to celebrate this victory. They also had done very well. They also had taken over a lot of Muslim lands in Spain at this point, and they wanted to do it someplace else, in new colonies. Um, and so, the Jews, the large number of Jews uh, who lived in Spain, who are, by the way, called um, Sfaradim. Uh, the word Sfarad uh, is the Hebrew word for Spain, um, and so hence they're known in history as Sephardic uh, Jews. But in 1492, with this new reconquest, um, the Jews were given a simple choice, either convert or leave. Um, so many converted, they're known in history as los conversos, and it was up to the Inquisition to find out who was uh, a real Jew or just faking it. Um, and um, that lasted until 1497, uh, when the Jews dis um, then went to uh, Portugal, the, um, it was time to, the Inquisition was getting more serious. They fled to uh, Portugal, and then they had to flee Portugal soon after. So this is going to be a story of, um, in part, what happens to these Sephardic Jews who sometimes are uh, real converts, sometimes fake converts, uh, happens after essentially 1497. They spread out uh, through the Ottoman Empire, uh, which is uh, at this point, North Africa, the Middle East, and certain parts of Europe, for example, through the Balkans. Um, but also to these newfound colonies that Columbus had um, stumbled upon. And um, so what we're going to see early on at this point, that the story of Jews and Jewish pirates, which is our topic, um, 
start, start in, um, in the Mediterranean in the early 1500s, uh, and then this model uh, is taken over to the Caribbean uh, a few decades later. So early in the 1500s, um, there was a famous, there are not many famous Jewish pirates, there are many Jewish merchants who spread around the world and work with pirates, but this was a famous Jewish pirate uh, named Sinan who was uh, working with Barbarossa, who was a, an Ottoman uh, admiral, um, and he um, was instilling fear in the, Span the Spanish ships in the Mediterranean in the early 1500s. That is another part of our story here, that um, the Jews hated Spain because they were thrown out, and um, other European countries, of which there were very few at the time, there were very few nation states, but there was England, there was France, we're also going to hear about the Netherlands, they are also bitter enemies of Spain. Um, who also want colonies in the Caribbean. And so these two um, forces um, are going to work together uh, to, try to, to try to get uh, Spanish territory. So for the first decades of the 1500s, uh, there was not a lot of competition in the Western Hemisphere, certainly from other countries, uh, because the Europeans didn't really care. I mean, there, was, there seemed to be no, no big deal there in the Western Hemisphere. But by the middle of the 1500s, certainly, uh, a lot of gold and silver starts coming back to Europe. So the other, uh, Mexico has been conquered by this time. Uh, South America, Peru, Bolivia uh, have been conquered, and vast amounts of gold and silver are coming back to Europe. So, so now the other European countries are saying, oh gee, maybe, these, uh, maybe we need to find something like this in the Western Hemisphere, maybe we need to find our own lands, and um, interest perks up, and we start also hearing about beginning pirate raids. Not a lot, but um, there, is, uh, there are ships to be uh, attacked, looted, uh, coming back with vast treasures to Europe. So we start beginning to get um, some piracy. Now I'm going to throw around three terms. I don't have a lot of time to define them in great detail, but we are going to use the terms pirates, privateers, and even buccaneers um, interchangeably occasionally. Pirates and privateers are mostly the same people. Privateers are uh, merchants who have ships that are occasionally used by particularly the British and the French to attack Spanish shipping. So when they're working for a foreign government, if they're licensed by the British and attacking Spanish shipping, then they're privateers. If they're working on their own as just thugs, uh, then they're pirates. The buccaneers uh, refer to a special time in history, roughly 1650 to 1700, when there were lots more pirates slash privateers because this was the height of the European contest in the Caribbean for colonies. And by other European countries, again, I really mean England, France, and to a lesser extent, uh, the Netherlands. Um, one place that's rather um, uh, an early haven uh, for the Jews in the Caribbean who are starting to leave, as I said, in the early 1500s. By the mid-1500s, we start having a Jewish community on the island of Jamaica. Uh, that is because um, Jamaica uh, was given by the Spanish crown to the Columbus family uh, as a private fiefdom, if you will. 
And Columbus, um, it is said, this may be the reason, may not be the reason, but it was said that Columbus, uh, the Columbus family was descended from uh, Genoese uh, Jews. It's not clear that was the case. I would say we probably don't want to claim him, actually, because um, he was a famous slave trader, which is where his sailing skills came from, and I guess many other sa sailors uh, got their sailing skills from the same profession. But anyway, um, Jamaica was known as kind of a safe haven, even in the middle 1500s, for these Iberian Jews who were fleeing Spain and Portugal and looking for a place to live in the Western Hemisphere. This next country, and uh, which is the Netherlands, including the city of Amsterdam. And um, the Netherlands w became a Spanish colony. It was taken over by, the, by Spain uh, the, and Habsburg rulers from 1568 to 1648. So now we have yet another people, another country that really hate the Spaniards. And uh, it is not entirely accidental that the Netherlands and the city of Amsterdam invite Jews uh, to come and live there. Uh, not because anybody loves the Jews, but the, Ju the Jews are looking for a safe ha haven, and they seem to be merchants who have huge networks by this time in the Western Hemisphere, in Europe, even in the East. So they're good for the economy, for building an economy. And by the year 1600, the city of Amsterdam was the richest city in the world. The Dutch are also beginning to go through their Protestant Reformation at this point, so they really want to get rid of the yoke of Spain. And they were somewhat tolerant of the Jews, but we have a um, the leader of the Jewish community there was somebody named Samuel Palache, and now we're about in the first couple of decades of the 1600s. And uh, Mr. Palache is known in history as, as, a, as a rabbi, as a privateer, and also a pirate, a very famous pirate. Uh, he is known also through history in a painting by Rembrandt from this period, from about 1630, called the uh, Man in the Oriental Costume, uh, but he is thought to be uh, Rabbi Samuel Palache, Rabbi Privateer and Pirate. Um, he is important in this story because he too is looking for safe havens for Jews and so his idea, and again, this is a little, this is getting pretty technical and complicated, is that one place could, for a, a safe haven for, for some members of the Jewish community, could be in northeastern Brazil. Northeastern Brazil in the early 1600s is controlled by the Dutch. And so it is safe for Jews to be there. And, um, there is also an incipient industry uh, that, is, that is starting there, uh, a sugar industry that is going to, in the next centuries, bring vast wealth to Europeans, to Jewish Europeans, and some folks in the Western Hemisphere. It's certainly the main reason to bring slaves to the Western hemisphere because you need a gigantic workforce to uh, produce sugar. Uh, Palace is um, supporting this, supporting Jews going to northeastern Brazil, and especially his two, um, two most famous pupils. <clears throat> uh, so now we're close to the mid-1600s, or the 1630s, 1640s, uh, Abraham uh, and Moses Cohen Enriquez, who um, are bringing Jews to the Western Hemisphere from Amsterdam, and uh, the, these guys are known as really quite famous Jewish pirates. By 1654, 
the Dutch lose control of northeastern Brazil. The Dutch do get their independence from Spain. However, if the Spaniards and Portuguese are coming back, and uh, Spain and Portugal had been linked, they had been one empire for some of those decades, um, then the Jews had to leave again. And so where did those Jews go? Well, the, so now we're in the 1640s, 1650s. Um, most go back to Amsterdam. Uh, one boat, and this is important uh, for our story, uh, gets blown off course and lands in Jamaica. And this is going to mean many more Jews are going to settle in Jamaica. And then another one heads for this new Dutch colony in the north, very far to the north, called New Amsterdam, which we may have heard of. Um, and the governor of New Amsterdam uh, is not terribly excited about having these Jewish refugees, but you know, what the heck, he, he accepted them. Chief rabbi of Amsterdam is still worried about um, where these people in, particularly in northeastern Brazil, are going to go. So he contacts uh, Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell is the leader of England at this point, and you can see the pattern over and over again. So the rabbi of Amsterdam says to, writes to Cromwell and says, if you will make sure that Jamaica can be a safe haven for the Jews, they will fight with, with the British and win um, Jamaica for Britain. It, by the middle of the 1600s, Jamaica was still nominally uh, in the control of the Columbus family, but not really. So this, the Spaniards were eyeing this place. Um, but Britain, by the middle of the 1600s, certainly would like to have this colony. Uh, and Cromwell says, yes, Jamaica can be a safe haven for Jews, and we will also take Jamaica as, or we will use their help to get Jamaica as a British island. Okay, so we're middle of the 1600s, 1650s. Um, Cromwell is delighted to now have uh, Jamaica as, as part of uh, a new English colony. Now, especially the French are kind of interested in getting a piece of the action, and they would also like some uh, colonies in the region. And the easiest, and so now we're getting to this period in history called the Buccaneer era. And uh, this is, an era that we sort of think of as the, the high point of, of piracy, uh, but why were there pirates? By the middle of the 1600s, there were many thousands of mostly stateless men in the Caribbean. They were mostly um, on the island of Hispaniola, which you probably know is not made up of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, and they were guys who had jumped ship, uh, mostly. If you know anything about being on a ship in the 1600s, it was very dangerous, it was very unhealthy, uh, it was very bad. Um, so there were lots of men who jumped ship, and there were many uh, also runaway slaves. This is not typically talked about as much in the story of um, uh, fighters and pirates and privateers in the Caribbean, but there were many runaway slaves also. Um, so they were hanging out uh, in central Hispaniola. The French, who are not dumb, decide that what's the best way to get stateless men someplace? Um, they bring lots of women to northwest Hispaniola, present-day Haiti, and especially an island off the northwest coast of Hispaniola called Tortuga. And so remarkably, they got these guys to, um, to come there and um, help the French 
using these gentlemen called buccaneers um, to secure Western Hispaniola for the French. At the same time, the governors of the governor of Jamaica is getting some of these young men and young runaway slaves to come to Jamaica and um, find other uh, Caribbean properties for the English. Now, again, most of the Jews at this time were not necessarily pirates, but they were merchants, they were privateers, they were certainly working with the pirates, they were buying and selling their goods, they were trading with the Europeans, and so they are an important part of the story, too. Moving to uh, Jamaica, or staying in Jamaica a little bit, we know by the middle of the 1600s that uh, a southern port in Jamaica, Port Royal, was known as the wickedest uh, city in the world. So maybe it was a pretty exciting time to be there. Um, and we also know that the wickedest pirate uh, was there at the time, Mr. Henry Morgan. Mr. Morgan was very famous, and not only was he looting for himself, but he was looting for Britain, because if you're um, a licensed pirate, which means you're a privateer, uh, you have to give a little bit of your loot to the crown. Um, and I should backtrack here for a second. The reason that, and this is a very important point, uh, the reason that these European countries, particularly England and France, and to some lesser extent the Netherlands, are relying on these pirates slash buccaneers slash privateers is Europe doesn't have modern armies yet. It's only in the beginning of the 1700s that the European nations start building what we think of as modern armies. So this is the best means of getting their uh, ends. Um, so, so Morgan is uh, emblematic of these uh, guys, these pirates, privateers. And the reason I, was, uh, I wanted to mention that there are no modern armies is because, of course, once you set up this pirate in business, uh, it's really hard to get them to stop. So the only way the English could get Morgan to stop looting and plundering, uh, which eventually they wanted, uh, was to make him lieutenant governor of um, Jamaica. So he dies a very rich and very honored man. Again, we want to uh, remember that this is this story of Jewish pirates, or more likely privateers slash merchants in the Caribbean, is um, a marriage of convenience between Jews, first of all, always looking for a safe place to be, and then working with uh, European powers other than Spain to, uh, who wanted to get colonies uh, in the region. So to conclude this very quick overview of 200 years of history, um, we would like to say that there were um, only a very few actual Jewish pirates uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, even during the high point of piracy, the Buccaneer era, which was 1650 to 1700, uh, but there were lots of mercenaries and there were lots of Jews uh, in the region uh, primarily looking for safety. Um, after roughly 1700, uh, most of the land claims in the um, Caribbean were recognized uh, by other European countries and also, um, the British and the French and the Dutch were starting to create modern armies, so they didn't need to rely on these pirates slash privateers anymore. Uh, the Jews were there 
because these, this was a safe haven and they could also um, make money. And the main place that the Jews found safe haven, as we've said already, was Jamaica, but we also should mention at least the tiny Dutch island of Curacao uh, off the north coast of South America, uh, which was a tr tiny trading port, but the, the Dutch were super rich at this time, so there was a lot of Dutch uh, trade going on, and Curacao also had a relatively large Jewish community. Um, and then finally, uh, in this, again, this very brief overview, uh, we started our story, let's say, in 1492, and now we've come up to 1700. Uh, at the beginning of our story, uh, Spain controlled everything in the Western Hemisphere. Actually, that's not entirely true. By accident, in 1494, they gave away um, Brazil, what is now Brazil, to Portugal, but that's another lecture. Um, but certainly in the Caribbean, Spain controlled everything. By the end of the 1600s, uh, Spain is left with only four places. Um, and so you can see how the great downfall, actually rather quickly, in, in the Caribbean region. So by the end of the 1600s, Spain controls only Cuba, Puerto Rico, two-thirds of the eastern two-thirds of Hispaniola, because by 1697, France has the western part of the island, um, which is going to be, fascinatingly, the which is now Haiti, uh, which was the largest and richest sugar colony in the Caribbean at the time. And then Spain has this fourth island called La Trinidad, which we now call Trinidad, which is Spanish for 100 more years and then becomes uh, British at the end of the 1700s. So finally, since I uh, owe this lecture to finding Mr. Kritzler's book, I want to quote something from him. Uh, he says in his book, uh, who is interested particularly to bring this back to the Jews of the Caribbean, um, he says we offer the history of, of Iberian Jews uh, disguised as Christians who pioneered the new world as explorers, conquistadors, cowboys, and pirates, they transformed the sugar industry into a multinational agro-industry uh, that, that they largely introduced into the Caribbean, and they created a trade, the first global, if you will, trade network spanning seven seas. Uh, certainly between the Western Hemisphere, Europe, and parts of Asia. Figures are imprecise, but it's estimated that the conversos, which is how they were referred to, the converted Jews, uh, numbered around 10,000 in the middle 1600s, um, uh, or 5% of all the settlers in the Western Hemisphere, but up to 15% in the Caribbean islands. So that is a pretty impressive um, percentage. So it is interesting to those of us who never ever realize, even those of us who studied the Caribbean, never realized the large percentage of Jews who were in the region and the various ways they participated in life over several centuries. So thank you very much.